So my name is Duncan, as uh, Alejandro had mentioned, and I work for TypeSafe. I'm a software engineer and I work on the monitoring team. Um, <clears throat> and what I want to talk to you about today is the notion of why reactive? What is reactive about? Um, first of all, show of hands, how many here are pretty experienced or feel they're pretty experienced with the ACA? Okay, fair amount, good. So, who many, let me ask another question. Who here has never heard of the term reactive in the context of programming the way TypeSafe defines it? Okay, good, good. At least, at least there's one. Um, in our world, a lot of times we're proactive, right? I was taught the uh, six P's, proper prior planning prevents poor performance. Uh, we set up to-do lists. We, we do all kinds of things. We try to hedge our bets and understanding. In the military, we call it situational awareness. You want to get a good idea of what's going on so you can prepare for it before it happens. And I think that's a good plan. We set up management systems, getting things done, and uh, Kanban, kind of, not actually Kanban's not really one, but uh, do it tomorrow and all kinds of things like that. So, because we have an expectation and uh, we want things to uh, follow that expectation. If you're real type A, you really do your homework, and when you get caught into a situation where you're not expecting things, it gets a little hectic and it gets a little crazy. In software though, and actually as we'll see here shortly, in organisms that's not quite the case. And why? It ends up being a big data problem. There is just too much stuff going on. There's too many variables. There's too many things changing rapidly for you to be able to proactively design a system that's going to meet its needs or meet the needs. So we'll start out here first of all so we're on the same playing field, what is reactive? And I'm going to define it uh, from the reactive manifesto. And then we're going to take a look at some examples. Uh, we're going to take a look at an example in biology, and we're going to take a look at ex an example in business. And then we'll dig into a little bit more detail of uh, being reactive, and then we'll see what happens when you're not reactive. So. The first thing is, what does reactive mean? Being ready to respond, uh, ready to be responsive to stimulus. We used to have this saying uh, uh, in the Army, over, under, or through, right? Uh, whatever your obstacle is, you're going to react to it, and you're going to uh, take the appropriate action. Or in Zen, be like water, right? When you meet resistance, flow around it. Basically, the idea is, you're encountering something, and then you're going to respond to it. It is stimulating you in some way. It is blocking you. It is causing you problems, whatever the case may be. You're going to respond appropriately to it. So this idea is not new. It's been around, actually, for some time. And it was kind of quantified from our perspective uh, in the Reactive Manifesto. If you haven't read it, you should go read it. Uh, the second version was published on the 16th of September last year. And it has some great people associated with it. Jonas, Dave, Roland, and Martin. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with some of those people, uh, they're pretty amazing. So Jonas is the CTO of, um, of TypeSafe. Roland is a, has a PhD in astrophysics, and Dave is one of the most um, awesome people in the world when it comes to concurrent programming, and Dave is pretty cool too. So, great people were involved in putting this together. And at the time that I first put this slide together a while ago, it had 11,000 signatures on it. So, it is something that is uh, short, it's not a difficult read, but it has some really, I think, interesting stuff. And I would say to you, it's not a design pattern, it's more of a philosophy is the way to think about it. It has these four components to it. And you'll see these boxes, and you'll see arrows drawn, and the arrows definitely mean something. So at the top is responsiveness, OK? 
Um, and we'll, we'll discuss more exactly what we mean by that. To the left and to the right, we have resilience, and at the bottom, we have message-driven. You'll notice that the arrow, arrows from message-driven support the other notions. So message-driven supports elasticity, message-driven supports resilience, and it supports responsiveness. <clears throat> so, again, going back to the dictionary, responsive. Let's define that term. Reacting in the desired or positive way. Quick to react, quick to respond. What I thought was interesting here was positive. Um, so I'll give you a simple example with humans, right? If I ask my daughter, I've used this one before in talks, but if I ask my daughter to clean her bedroom and she does not respond to me, uh, I don't know what's going on. Is she being belligerent? Is she being disrespectful? Did she not hear me? What is the case, right? I have no uh, response back. If she says, Dad, would you mind if I clean it up in an hour? I'm finishing up my last piece of homework. I'd say, OK, that's great. Sure, no problem. Um, so an example of uh, responsiveness. Couples often always have this question. You're not responding to me. I hear this many times. I'm learning to be more responsive. Um, Elasticity, able to return to its original shape or size after being stretched, squeezed, etc. Able to be changed. So elasticity, um, one of the things I've seen in uh, future, future uh, mechanical engineering is this uh, uh, notion of elastic metal, right? Where the metal's pliable and then it'll take shape based on a certain situation and whatnot, things like that. So the idea here of elasticity is you're able to basically bend and flex to adjust to the current situation, and then you come back to your original shape. Resilience, uh, think a constitution, strong, healthy. You're able to recover, successful after something bad happens. The best way I like to describe resilience is through the notion of self-healing, right? There's a marked difference between fault tolerance and resilience, right? Fault tolerance is a proactive approach to failure. Resilience is a reactive approach to failure. And how you design systems is affected by how you define this word, right? So the idea, again, is self-healing in many ways. Something bad happens, the appropriate steps are taken, and uh, you're back in good shape. And then finally, message-driven. Unfortunately, there is no message-driven word in the dictionary, so we have to define them both. The first one is a verbal, written, or recorded communication sent to or left for a recipient who cannot be contacted directly. Messaging, a message. And driven, operated, moved, controlled, or specified by a person or source of power. So the idea is, is something is moving or operating, writing, sending a message to a recipient that there is no direct uh, connection to, okay? All right, so a little bit of biology, Moz and reactive, an example from nature. So I think one of the things that's very fascinating about species is we're able to observe within a species uh, changes in their, in their, their um, DNA makeup. And one of the species that this is, is kind of like the canonical test example is this moth, uh, uh, first noted in Great Britain, called the peppered moth. And the interesting thing about this was back during the Industrial Revolution, Great Britain started pumping out a lot of uh, soot and a lot of pollution into the environment. <clears throat> I remember when I was a kid, the West Vaco paper plant in Maryland sat at the base of a valley and the entire top of the mountain was bare because of the pollution that the plant had pumped out up there until they started putting scrubbers in, in the uh, stack, then the trees started growing back. But I can't imagine what Great Britain looked like uh, um, 
in the 19th century. And what happened is on the trees, they had these things called lichens, which we'll see a picture of. And they're multicolored, generally light colored in um, flavor. And they started to die because of the pollution. And the trees themselves started to get covered with this dark black soot. And the impact that it had on the uh, environment, especially for the peppered moth, was, was quite profound. So to the right there, we have lichen on trees. And it's essentially a slow-growing plant. Uh, it forms like this crusty-like uh, uh, texture to it. And a lot of people think lichens are bad. They're actually not. If you go into um, an older forest, right, where the trees are a little bit more sparse, they need uh, sunlight to grow, or in the uh, edges of the forest, you'll see lichens. There are forms of fungus and things like that that aren't good for trees, but in general, it's not a sign of, of uh, that the, the tree is unhealthy. You will find them on older trees, though, more often because the, the wood starts to separate a little bit and it's easier for the plant to get in. You see them on rocks and walls and stuff like this. Well, these, these uh, lichens started to die, right? And the light-colored moth, which was the majority in the population, uh, was easily camouflaged, which you'll see uh, in a moment. They found themselves to be a target. As that light-colored lichen died, they now stuck out against the darker bark. Their uh, rare-colored dark ones now began to blend into the uh, background, right? Dark moth, dark tree. The camouflage flips in the, in the population, and the birds change from eating the, uh, oops, I've got to flip that around. The birds change from eating the light moths to the dark ones, or sorry, from the dark moths to the light moths. And the entire population changed. So here's an example of a lichen covered tree. And when I first saw this photograph, I couldn't even see the, the light colored moth. So I circled it in red. OK, so this is the peppered moth before the Industrial Revolution. You can see to the right uh, the, the darker colored moth. And this is after. Pretty significant difference. <clears throat> so if you step back and think about this for a second, we have a situation here where the, the dynamics of our system have changed significantly. And what are we going to do? How can we handle this? OK? This moth sticks out, you know, bird flying over. Easily can see that moth, where previously, bird flying over could see the other moth. So if this species is to survive because this is the minority, something's got to happen. It's an important word, survive. So what do the moths do? The peppered moth survives because baked into its DNA was a mutation that allowed it to react to its environment. And it's this ability to react to stimulus or react on the fly is what reactive is all about and designing reactive systems. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk more about that in a minute. But it's more than just responding. It's, it's, it's a, a whole way of thinking, is what I would argue. So the peppered moth responded by being elastic, by being resilient, and be, by being message driven. So, the first one, elasticity, load, right, is typically how we think of it responding to load. In the peppered moss situation, <laughs> load came in two forms, unexpected, there was the increased pollution, which changed the, the environment, 
and resultant as a result of this first type of load. Load can compound, right? That's how cascading failures happen in load balance systems. So resultant, the lack of camouflage. And the peppered moth dealt with it with this mutation baked into its DNA and it allowed that population to rebound. So the dynamics changed. The dark colored moth became the um, <clears throat> majority. Failure, right? Resilience. How is the moth resilient? Well, failure came in the form of the light colored moss camouflage no longer worked. One or five nodes in our cluster are no longer enough. Okay? The mutation allowed the moth population to respond to this failure. It was baked in to the DNA of the organism. This is the fun one, message driven. How is the peppered moth message driven? Well, organisms' physiologic processes are message driven. What we all are in here is one big biological ACA system. You didn't know that, did you? You're written in Scala, that's your source code, your DNA. The endocrine system, right? It broadcasts hormonal messages to cells through the blood system and extracellular fluid. And it's really, it's, it's like a radio broadcast, right? There needs to be a receiver. Does this not sound like an actor system, right? It broadcasts messages. Just go and have problems with your thyroid and find out. Something's happening. You're either hypo or, or I forget what the other one is. And uh, that means your inbox is too full or not enough, right? It's, it's uh, having problems processing messages. Perhaps there's some synchronicity going on inside there. And the message system is not working properly. There's also the nervous system which is a point-to-point -point controlled message system, like a telephone system. So again, it's message-based, very fast. Uh, you can kind of think of streams in a little ways, but it's a very fast system. So we know the physiological processes within all, especially complex organisms, but even single cell life forms, uh, is message driven. Our DNA is actually a binary code. But in this particular case we're talking about a mutation which is a little bit different in the sense that it has to do with the way the genes are structured and they have to be reordered and th this reordering just happened to be a positive thing. So in a lot of cases mutations are not positive. In the case of this moth, it happened to be positive, and it caused it to be re-altered. Whatever the, the specifics are, whether something was deleted, inserted, or, or uh, rearranged, uh, um, at the end of the day, it resulted in a positive response. Being that a moth is a more complex organism, uh, in single cells, they'll exchange DNA they have a filament that they attach to each other and they send DNA messages back and forth. In more complex ones, it happens in this one act called reproduction. That's when the DNA is passed on. So in order for the moth to become black, the, the, uh, the genetic sequence had to be the messaging, the DNA messaging had to be encoded and passed on through reproduction but it's still a message and it was still passed on. And what's interesting about this is this for multicellular organisms, this rule is so universal that it's often referred to as the taboo of intercellular transfer of genetic information. 
I bet you didn't think you were going to learn about genetics today, did you? So, embodied in the DNA of this moth was a message, right, that had an algorithm in it, that had intelligence to it, to allow this moth to respond to its environment. Have you ever heard of a supervisor pattern? Right? In monitoring, we're working on building um, uh, things like self-monitoring actors and, and making monitoring in and of itself very reactive to be able to scale in and out based on system, right? Because whenever you monitor a system, there's always overhead. Okay, and so being able to monitor something in a passive way that's able to degrade uh, as not to cause problems with your system is a very difficult problem, right? And so, um, believe it or not, a lot of things like this and a lot of algorithms that have nothing to do with programming come into play in these types of scenarios. So business reactive. Uh, how did we get here? Um, well, one of the things about uh, us, I mean, can you imagine not having the internet right now? I mean, we don't have Wi-Fi in here, and it's probably crippling most of us. When I, f when I landed, to my amazement, my cell phone data did not work. I'm like, Canada, United States, aren't they the same thing? Right? <laughs> what do you mean I don't have any internet access? Uh, and <laughs> I was, like, stunned. I remember hiking, backpacking one time. And uh, I had a thing on my cell phone, and I had no reception, and this is before it used the GPS. And I'm standing here looking at a split three ways, a fork. And I'm like, I'm lost. And I think, you idiot. You've done orienteering for like 20 years. Pull out your stupid map and compass, right? and figure out where you are. So I did it, and it was, it was easy. But a very uncomfortable feeling, right? And it's the same thing here, the internet. This has had, one of the, I think, one of the greatest impacts ever. It's like this treasure trove of knowledge. You just turn your computer on, and well, there can be some pretty bad things too. But in some ways, it's like the wild, wild west. But one of the greatest impacts on mankind. I mean, you can download schematics for 3D printers to print all kinds of stuff, right? Commissioned by the US to build this robust, fault-tolerant computer network. This is starting to sound familiar, right? And a series of memos by this gentleman, J.R. Um, Licklider from MIT, is, is when this started. There were other people invent, or I mean, part of the process, but he's the one that's generally given credit. So it wasn't Al. Sorry, guys. Al Gore, in case you didn't know. Um, it became known as this galactic network concept was the original name. And the idea was an envisioning of this globally interconnected network. You know, on the plane up here, I'm riding up, and I watched uh, Terminator Genesis. And every time I read this, I think of uh, Cyberdyne and I forget, Skynet, that's what it was called. But anyways, this globally interconnected network and it would allow users to access data and use programs from anywhere in the world. That was the mission. That was the idea. Um, a lot of people think, you know, the military was just nice and they gave it over. No, from the beginning, it was meant to be used uh, ultimately by the public. So he was the director at the time. It was uh, called Information Processing Techniques Office. It was part of ARPA. And today, it's known as DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And a lot of great things have come out of DARPA through this history. They, some of the robots they're looking at. And, and I've seen uh, yesterday um, someone who could not walk uh, because they were, had a spinal injury. They bypassed the nerves down the spine. They implanted a chip in his legs. And then he wore uh, like a hat that connected to the chips, and they were able to bypass the whole nervous system. And the brain, through um, therapy, was able to uh, recall the messages that say walk, 
take step, move left foot forward, and the young man uh, can now walk. Very, very early stages, but just fascinating the things that they're doing. Um, then we had this notion of distributed systems. And this represented a pretty significant shift in the, pair, uh, the way that we uh, thought about networking and computers. Uh, before that, primarily we had large, expensive mainframes. A long, long time ago, I used to work on uh, IBM 30 something or other, 38, 36, I forget. IBM DBC and COBOL, Fortran. And uh, they're pretty cool, but um, until your program crashes and you have to look through this 30-page dump of hex characters that makes no sense, and it, yeah. So anyways, um, we still use mainframes today, and they can be part of a distributed system. Uh, we'll talk about that a little, in a little bit too. Big iron is what they were referred to, centralized computing model and they focused on efficiency and scalability, although the scalability part, local scalability and reliability. Then cloud computing. We, uh, we know what cloud computing is, right? Cloud computing, while distributed computing was about architecture, cloud computing was about economics. Taking uh, what we've learned in distributed computing, companies started springing up and building really just localized, optimized, or not localized, but connected to the internet networks, kind of like hosting environments, and they, they started charging by usage rather than just a flat fee in a lot of ways. Uh, less expensive, another paradigm shift, and it comes down to economics, right? It changes the way we think about our applications. I used to be in the energy industry, and um, one of the things that we talked about was security all the time. And one of our applications ran in the cloud, and sometimes we get pushed back by that. And so I'd have a discussion with the IT people, because we used to have to go through rigorous security audits. And I said to them, I said, do you honestly think that your data center is more secure than Amazon's? I said, the only way that your data center is more secure than Amazon's is if you unplug it. Right? I think Amazon spends over a billion dollars a year in security. Are they perfect? No. Are they the only ones? No. Have they been hacked? Yes. But um, security is an interesting thing. One of the most powerful things about security is if someone doesn't know you're there. Believe it or not, that's huge. It's an onion skin approach. There's multiple layers. There is no impregnable force. The only way a system's impregnable is to disconnect it. Okay. Um, but anyways, that's a different discussion. So economics. We had advances in cores and all these types of things that 10 years ago didn't exist, eight years ago didn't exist, or they started to exist. And so some interesting things started happening. Here's a graph that shows you storage, network, CPU, and bandwidth, and the costs associated with them over time. And as you can see, the cost of storage and um, the uh, use of networks, the storage cost goes down, the use goes up. The same thing with CPU, both of them, the cost goes down and bandwidth cost goes down. I used to have an ISP a while back and I paid $3,000 a month for two T1s. Now I pay uh, 60 bucks a month for 75 meg up and down. It's like insane. But that's the advancement of technology. This change, though, has had an impact on us, just like the internet, right? It's kind of like an equalizer. Um, we have to understand, first of all, what the change is, and then we have to react to it accordingly as um, thinking from the perspective of a business. So, for example, Amazon, when they started out, their uh, retail sales was their business, right? Amazon were an online bookstore, they started selling other stuff. Well, to support this phenomenal growth, they had to create a new way of thinking about system design, right? So they laid the foundation, though, them, Netflix, Google, uh, Apple, uh, these companies laid the foundation for how these distributed systems are gonna work and 
they said, hey, why don't we start selling this? Right? Why don't we start selling our cloud computing? So in 2008, they announced that their um, services right, consume more bandwidth than their retail sales do. So the services that we use on Amazon or whoever crossed over in 2008 and the sky's the limit on them. So you got to ask yourself, what is Amazon? What is your company that you work for? Is it a bookstore or is it a provider of cloud services? I've heard Netflix say, we're not a, we're not a movie company. We're a, we're a data logging company that just happens to stream video. That's profound, right? That's a cultural thing. Users are expecting performance, sub-second. We have spikes in load, predictive and unpredictive. Uh, we have need for parallelism, big data, fast data. Every day there's a new name for data, right? Um, in the petabytes. I believe you have to embrace these changes and you have to incorporate them into your behavior, into your DNA. So we're coming close to the end here. Some of the key ideas, which I'm sure you're familiar with, asynchronous communication, the message-driven concept, the sender and the recipient, and how they communicate that propagation is not affected by, or, or the, the, how that works is not affected by the way the message is delivered or transmitted. Um, fire and forget kind of ideas. And it leads to a loosely coupled design. So adopting this type of approach gives you the ability to be elastic and resilient, which ultimately makes you responsive. Don'ts. Never, ever lock. I love this picture. So these are the message-driven don'ts. Don't ever, ever block. Do's. Go asynchronous. Actors. If you're unfamiliar with CRDTs, they're really cool. They're replicated in memory uh, data structures that replicate extremely fast. And so regardless of where you come into the cluster and what node it's on, your data looks the same. It's still eventually consistent, but it's designed to kind of be like a distributed cache, if you will. Uh, we have them in an ACA called um, uh, ACA Distributed Data. I think that's what we used to be called something else, and we just renamed it. Um, Reactive streams, futures, there's all kinds of things of, uh, to be asynchronous with. Elasticity. So, responsive, right? You can't be elastic under load, I'm sorry, you can't be responsive under load unless you scale, unless you're elastic. Scaling up, scaling down, scaling in and out. The way ACK is designed is that those two concepts are the same. Um, when load is low, you scale down, you save money, and it ensures servicing your growth. So don'ts. Never, ever block, right? This is the death knell of scalability when you block. Um, blocking of any kind anywhere will measurably impact your ability to scale. Contention, waiting for cues and coherency, the delay for data to become persistent. When you block for any reason, the first thing I look for in code is a wait.result. If you have written ACA and you have put an await.result in your code anywhere, don't tell anybody, quickly run and remove it. I have an algorithm that will find you. 
Elasticity dues, location transparency. Um, explicit distributed computing, right? When you're on a single machine uh, with something like ACA, you're still a distributed system, right? Because it uses multiple cores as scaling up. Local communication is an optimization. Locality of data. Think ACA persistence or the CDRTs or CRDTs again. Um, Async message passing, etc. Do share nothing, right? It's mine. If multiple threads have access to state variable that's mutable without synchronization, period, your program is broken. I've seen it a million times. Do not share anything. Take this guy's approach. It's mine. You can't have it. Embrace immutability. Immutable collections, defensive copies. Mutability is OK if it's inside a thread safe container. Um, so inside an actor, for example. Even then, though, it should just be a container, and the thing it's containing should be immutable. Resilience. Responsive in the face of failure. Expect the unexpected and embrace it by building your systems in isolation. A single point of failure remains a single point of failure. Isolate your systems, your microservices, whatever you want to call them. Replicate them through uh, different nodes. Come up with strategies for reprovisioning. Don'ts. Don't build monolithic systems. OK, you can't see this diagram too well, but your typical monolithic system that's vertically sliced, centralized, it doesn't have to be an RDBMS. It could be any database, but centralized, blocking drivers, tightly coupled middleware, blocking IO-based comms. This works great until it doesn't. Then you are hosed big time. Believe me, I know. I went through it with a pretty big system. I had to completely rewrite it. Load balancers. Load balancers themselves aren't bad, um, but they end up being a root of cascading failures. Dues. The actor system. Supervision. You're familiar with these. Resume, restart, stop, escalate. Some type of supervisory pattern that gives you self-healing. Bulkheads for you transformer fans. Isolate failure, compartmentalize, manage failure locally. Avoid cascading failures. Oops. So the ship bulkheads is where the idea comes from. Responsiveness. It's the cornerstone of usability. OK, you need to respond. If your application is not responsive, you're going to lose customers. If you lose customers, your profits are going to fall. If your profits fall, sometimes we lose our job. If we lose our job, we can't pay our bills. It affects our family. This is very real. Impact, right? So, be reactive. Everyone's happy. The customers are happy, boss is happy, and you're happy. So, two quick things, the results of being non-reactive. First is this great quote, uh, the new world it is not the big fish which eats the small fish, it's the fast fish which eats the slow fish. Right? So we have technologies at our disposal now to allow us to build these types of, uh, these types of technologies. Embrace them, use them, learn them, master them. Become a craftsperson. Right? Don't just become a good programmer, become an architect. Strive for that. It takes work. If it didn't, everyone would be doing it.
And I love this one. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Mike Tyson. That's so true. Proactive management. You need to, be re you need to react to being punched in the face. So that's it. Thank you very much.